Well, Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Paul Henry, and this is, once again, Four Winds Church, our online teaching ministry. And I want to welcome you to our study. If you're just now joining us, uh, we've been going through a study called The Big Picture. It's the idea of looking at the scriptures from beginning to end to try to get the big picture, the overall view of what's going on, and uh, possibly answer the question, why? is all of this going on. <clears throat> We've made it to this all-important section of the Torah and the church. And right now we're in part six on that particular section of our study. <clears throat> and this one is real important. I know I say that every week because why? Well, the scriptures are important. Um, but we've been trying to lay down a baseline up to this point on what the scriptures say and why and what's going on in Israel's place and all this and replacement theology and how everything has gotten really distorted before we embraced this section of scripture or this section of our study, which is the Torah and the church. And what we've been doing now, even with this part of the study, is laying a baseline that Yeshua is God. He became flesh, died on the cross, rose on the third day, ascended to heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father. Well, <clears throat> the things he said are important and we're going to use the words of Yeshua as our baseline. If Paul or Peter or Luke or some unknown author or whatever, whatever pundit, preacher, prognosticator, teacher, whatever, <clears throat> if they're preaching and teaching something contrary to the very words of our Messiah, then either they are wrong or we don't understand what they're saying because Yeshua can't be wrong. If he's wrong or lying to us or misleading us, then he's not the Messiah and then I am and we are wasting our time with all this dribble. But it's not dribble, it is important, and he's not wrong. So <clears throat> that's our baseline. You can bring up whatever you want, but I'm going to keep going back to, but what did Yeshua say? Before you start twisting what Paul said or anybody else and make it say something that it actually doesn't say, but if that's the route you're going to go, okay, we're going to compare that to what Yeshua said. And if it contradicts, if what you're saying contradicts what Yeshua said, I'm out. <laughs> Straight up, I'm out. If that's what you actually believe and that's what you want to go with, that's between you and God. Wear yourself out. Good luck with that. I have. I'm, that's all I'm going to say. <clears throat> For me personally, I'm going to go with what Yeshua said because God Almighty said, "This is my Son, in whom my wealth, I'm well, I'm well pleased." Listen to Him. He also said, "I'm going to send a prophet like Moses. I'm going to put my words in His mouth. You are to listen to Him. If you don't listen to Him, I personally am going to hold you accountable for it." Wow. So I'm going to listen to Yeshua over somebody's interpretation of what Paul says. So with all of that said, let's pray together. We're going to continue in this study, and we're going to look at more verses that and statements that Yeshua made, adding even more validity to the Torah. And before you get all upset, Almost half of your New Testament is doing nothing more than quoting your Old Testament. Secondly, there's a lot of stuff in the Old Testament law, if you will, Torah, that you can't do. Not that you shouldn't, you can't. Why? Because we're not in the land, there's not a temple service, there's not priests, there's not a sacrificial system, all of that, you can't do it. Uh, so take a deep breath, relax. It's going to be okay. But your eyes should begin to be opening to the truth that the scriptures still all apply to our lives where appropriate. If it's appropriate, it, then it applies. And then from there, do your best. Amen. Let's pray together. We're going to jump off in this study. 
And uh, I hope it's a blessing to you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would cause your word to come to life for us. It would speak to us from our heart and draw us closer to you. And we pray all this in Yeshua's name. Amen. So, like I already said in there in my introduction, uh, what we've been doing and what I've been trying to do so far is to lay this baseline that we're going to compare everything else to that we talk about throughout the rest of our study in this section on the Torah and the church. And in summary, once again, what we're saying is that Yeshua is the physical representation of God on this earth. Died, buried, rose again, all of that stuff. And what he he said, his teachings and his life and everything is flawless. And I'm sure that everybody that's taking the time to watch this would agree with that statement, that the teachings, the word, the very life of Yeshua is flawless. If he's not flawless, then he's not the perfect lamb without blemish who died for our sins. So even even his words, his teachings, his admonitions, his life are flawless. Should be the end of the discussion, right? But for some people, they just need to know more. Okay, let's just continue to look at what Yeshua said. So today we're going to start looking at some of the passages that clearly, I believe, point to the validity of the Torah in the life of the believer today, once again, where appropriate. So let's begin and look at something, some more statements that Yeshua made. So if you go to Matthew chapter 7, verses 12 through 14, if you got your Bibles, get that out and look at it with me or pull it up on your phone or something. This is amazing. It's a little statement that we all, and it's a section of scripture we all agree with, but the implications of the statement of Yeshua here is huge. And it should be, once again, okay, end of the story. But let's read it. It says, So in all things do to others what you would want them to do to you, for this is the Torah and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the greatest the gate is wide, and the way is broad that leads to destruction and those who enter through it are many. How narrow is the gate and difficult the way that leads to life, and those who find it are few. So last week, we discussed the most terrifying passage in all of Scripture found in Matthew chapter 7, once again, but verses 15 through 23, where he says, Lord, Lord, there are going to be many that are going to say, Lord, Lord, and they're not getting into the kingdom. But now I want to look at what he said just prior to that most terrifying passage. And it's referred to as the golden rule. Everybody believes you should follow the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Treat others the same way you would want them to treat you. And this is why it's called the golden rule. It's the standard rule, right? The very standard of justice and moral decency. I cannot even imagine any Christian saying that we shouldn't follow this golden rule. However, (laughs) I'm sorry I'm giggling, I find it interesting that those same people, many They ignore the very definition of that rule given by Yeshua himself. So Yeshua states what the definition of the golden rule is. To treat others as you would have them treat you. He says, this is the Torah and the prophets. Wow! Yeshua is telling us that when you follow this rule, the golden rule, you are encapsulating the very heart of the Torah and the prophets. But modern Christian teachers say, we don't have to follow the Torah, which means, by definition, you do not have to follow the golden rule. What makes me nuts 
I'm sorry, but what makes me nuts is when people refuse to be intellectually honest, at least with themselves, and at least be intellectually consistent. Stop talking out of both sides of our mouths, saying different things, looking at each other with a smile on our face and say, but I'm saying the same thing. When you're not, at least be intellectually honest with yourself and at least try to be intellectually consistent. So we say, well, we should follow the golden rule. Jesus told us what that meant. Oh, yeah, but we don't have to do that. Is Jesus God? Yeah. Should we follow him? Yeah. Should we do what he says? Yeah, but I ain't doing that. It's just, it's amazing. It's nonsensical. It's moronic. It's it's craziness. Um, it's just absurd to think that we don't have to be nice and loving towards our fellow mankind. But folks, this is not the only time that Yeshua said this. Now, I want you to notice what he says or says something like this. I want you to notice what he says in Matthew again, but this is now found in Matthew chapter 22. Now, in Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. So jot that down, Matthew 22, verses 34 through 40. It says, But the Pharisees, when they heard that Yeshua had silenced (coughs) the Sadducees, they gathered together in one place and testing him, one of the one of them, a lawyer or scribe, (coughs) excuse me, said, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the Torah? And he said, You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He doesn't stop talking. He continues. So you have to continue reading. The entire Torah and prophets hang on these two commandments. So Yeshua is asked by a legal scribe, a, a, a lawyer of the Torah, What's the greatest commandment? He says, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But there's another that's just like it. You should love your neighbors yourself. Doesn't that sound like what we just read just a few chapters prior in Matthew chapter 7? You should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Here he says, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And he defined it back in Matthew. Now he's defining it. Again, but he's going even further in his definition. Now he's saying to love God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself, the entire Torah, the entire word of God is literally hanging by these two commands to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. All of your Bible is hanging on those two commandments. Yeah, but we don't have to do it. It, It's How much more clear does Yeshua have to make it for us to get it through our heads that the Torah still applies to our lives where appropriate? That means that we should do everything in the Torah that we can do wherever we're living. But we must, and I repeat that we must be careful Only do what it says the way it says it. And if there's not a temple service and priestly system and all that stuff, and you're not in the land, there are so many things in the Torah that you can't do. You can't. Uh, I should be able to just say, okay, case closed. We're we're done. Because here's the deal. What Yeshua is saying is that when you follow the Torah and you're mature in it, this is teaching you how to do this. This should never get you away from these two. This is the goal, the target of the Torah to teach you how to love God and how to love your neighbor. 
as yourself. You can't learn that outside of what God said. You can't make this stuff up in your own head and say, God's going to be fine with it. When he said a lot of things in his Torah, he's not fine with. He doesn't like it. And yet we do it all the time and say, don't you like that, God? He goes, no, not really. I told you not to do that. And yet you're doing it, especially in the Christian church today. It is a quagmire of ungodliness, quite honestly, called godliness with a smile. Sorry if I get passionate about it, but being a pastor and a preacher and somebody that used to not understand this as a pastor and preacher, it just, it makes me nuts. So let me add this comment here again. Take a deep breath and relax. You're already, if you're a Christian, you're already following most of the Torah if you're a serious follower of Yeshua. The New Testament is filled with, there are more laws, more rules, more explanations about the Torah in the New Testament than what's found in the Torah. Because I'm just a New Testament Christian. I don't follow the law. Really? Uh, really? Do you, are you kind to people? Are you open to gossip and slander and murder and malicious things? Are you stirring up division within the community? Uh, that's just a start. There's tons of regulations in the Old Testament explaining the Torah. Log- logistically, there's only 613 commands in the Torah. There's, I think, over 1,500 in your New Testament. It's either 15 or 1,200. I can't remember now off the top of my head. There's a lot. There's more than twice as many. In the New Testament, it's what's in the Torah. Oh, but I'm I'm not a legalist. I'm, I'm a man of grace. Well, sorry, but you're actually biblically illiterate and you don't even understand the words coming out of your own mouth. Uh, most Christians, at least in thought, still believe in the validity of at least nine of the Ten Commandments. The one that most do not believe in is the keeping of the Sabbath. They replace it with the keeping of their Sabbath, which is another mind-boggling, mind-twisting statement. On whatever day they want, um, which is usually Sunday if they're doing that. But some people say, well, I don't take my, my Sabbath on Sunday because blah, blah, blah. So my Sabbath is actually Monday or my Sabbath is Thursday. But that that's my Sabbath. Like, uh, you ever tried to read your Bible from the beginning? God said he sanctified the seventh day, told us to remember the seventh day to keep it and keep it holy and that it's his Sabbath. Um, but okay. You want to have your own, you have that discussion with God. I'm just telling you, you need to read your Bible. Um, I only bring, um, all of that up to help us look, you need to relax and take a deep breath. It's all okay, but it's not what you've been told. You're already doing much of it without even realizing it. Because, again, your New Testament is nothing more than a commentary on the Old Testament on this is how you live this out and this is how you practice this. That's what the apostles were doing with all these new believers. They were explaining to them, this is how this works. This is what you're supposed to be doing. They didn't have anything to show them what to do except the Torah and the prophets and the writings. So it could not be any more clear, quite honestly, what Yeshua is saying in these two passages. In just these two alone, it should be clear. If you really want to learn how to love God and love others, it's in your Torah. I didn't say that. Yeshua did. 
The greatest commandment is to love God with everything that you've got. The next one, just like it, he said, is to love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang. They're hanging on these two principles from the Torah, the very heart of the Torah. That is what the Torah is supposed to be pointing us toward. Um, It's the very goal of the Torah. Now think about that for a moment. The goal of observing the teachings and instructions of God, i.e. the Torah, is to help us learn how to love God and how to love people. That's the goal. Out of the very words of our Savior. You want to argue that? You're arguing with Yeshua, God in the flesh. You're not arguing with me. I'm just telling you what he said. I'm not even getting into Greek and Hebrew. That's just in your English translation. It should be straightforward and simple. Done. Case closed. But for a lot of people, it's still not case closed. They still need more proof. And I've really kind of reached the point where I'm thinking, if you need more proof, then you don't want proof. What you want is for somebody to validate what you already believe. You don't want to really find truth. You don't want to really understand what Yeshua said and adjust your life accordingly to what he said. What you're hunting for is validation that what you already believe is the truth. Therefore, you don't have to change anything. That's not searching for truth. That's searching for comfort. When it comes to eternity, I would rather search for the truth of God. That's me. Uh, We're told that we're supposed to love God and yet don't do the things that he told us to do in order that we might learn how to love God. Think about that for a second. Jesus tells us that doing this is going to teach you how to love God. But pundits today, Christian teachers, are going to say, you need to love God, but don't do the things that God said that's going to teach you how to love him. They say that it'll take them 45 minutes to say that. And it'll take them 45 minutes to say it because they're going to have to dance a dance that will be intellectually stimulating and get you off target and get you to thinking about all this other garbage so that you can't actually hear what they're actually saying. What they're actually saying is, yeah, you don't have to do the Torah. You should learn how to love God. Learn how to love him the way I tell you to. It's not the Torah. That's for those Jews. It's not for us. It's it's nonsense. It's hogwash should be just case closed. Um, I want to learn how to love God better. God says, I've set aside some very special times that I'd like to meet with you. And we usually go, yeah, but I don't want to meet on those days. I want to set up my own. I want my own Sabbath. I want my own holidays. I want my own stuff. I want my own way of worship. I can guarantee you that most of the stuff that we call worship today, I don't think God's pleased with it at all. A whole lot of it is doing nothing but pointing to us, pointing to us instead of just bringing glory and honor to him and his name. I'll leave that there for now. So, but most people do agree that we should follow the commands of Jesus sort of. They they say that, but they don't actually practice it. Okay. Well, once again, remember what we just talked about. Let's look at something else Yeshua said once again in Matthew. So in Matthew chapter 15, verses three through nine. This is amazing because based on what we're talking about, Now just listen to what Yeshua is saying. And it should be gut-wrenching, should be, for Christians and pastors today. And answering them, this is Matthew 15, verses 3 through 9, he said to them, 
Why do you also transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother must be put to death. But whoever, but you say, whoever tells his father or mother whatever you might have gained from me as a gift to God, he need not honor his father on account of your tradition. And that's just one of his examples. On account of your tradition, you made void the word of God. Hypocrites, he calls them. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Case closed. Once again, Yeshua could not be more clear. He can't be more clear. Can't be more straightforward. And my goodness, when you apply that to your typical Christian church today, typical Christian teaching, it should be terrifying once again. For those that say, I don't have to keep the Torah. I don't have to learn how to worship God. I don't have to learn how to love God. And I don't have to learn how to love other people. I can come up with that on my own. Matter of fact, my pastor told me I can do that. And I don't have to do this. And right here, Yeshua is saying, well, wow, you know what? When you're saying that, you're following your traditions because that's not in your scriptures. That's going directly against what Yeshua said. Directly against it. If you still hold to the teachings and the idea that you don't need to follow the Torah because Jesus died on the cross and nailed it to the cross, now it's done away with, when that's not what he said. And you don't have to follow the Torah when Yeshua said, loving God, loving people is the goal. All of the Torah and the prophets hang on those two commandments. Everything in here is hanging on those two commandments. Oh, but we don't want that. We just want this. How do you know how to do that without this? Oh, trust me, I got it. Good luck with that. And right here, Yeshua is saying, well, you know what? You got all these commandments that you've come up with that actually go right against what the Word of God says, and you're making the Word of God void because of your commands that are man-made? And then here he says, you're worshiping God, me, in vain. Oh, wow. Wow. Doesn't that sound exactly like what he said in Matthew 7? There are going to be many that are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do great and mighty things in your name? Yeshua, didn't we do great and mighty things in your name? We cast out demons in your name. We preached in your name. We brought many people down the aisle in your name. We did miracles and healings and all kinds of stuff in your name. And he says, depart from me, those of you who work lawlessness. Because I never knew you. This stuff can't be any more cyclical, repetitive, or clear. Yet most people still do not want to accept the fact that the Torah is still legitimate. So I want you to, let's think through this for a second. I want you to consider his words that we just read very carefully. Yeshua is challenging the religious leaders with this, that they transgress the Torah, the very word of God, for the sake of their traditions. And watch this. He repeats this thought in that short section three times. One of the laws in biblical hermeneutics is if something is repeated in close proximity, pay attention. If it's repeated, pay attention. But if it's repeated multiple times in close proximity, that's God's way. That's Yeshua's way of saying, how about if I wave a red flag for you and say, you need to pay attention. Danger ahead if you go against what I'm instructing you to do right now. 
The crazy part is that right here, Yeshua, what he what he's saying, he's saying this by quoting Isaiah. Hmm. One of the prophets. And he's quoting Isaiah saying that even Isaiah was saying they are worshiping me in vain because they were replacing the word of God with their own traditions and man-made commandments and then considering those commandments and traditions as the very commands of God. <clears throat> this is what Yeshua spent his whole earthly ministry dealing with with the religious leaders over and over and over again. Once again, I need to state that this mindset should put terror in the hearts of those that read these passages. Are we today so arrogant that we think that we can do the very same things of these that these people were doing that God was so mad at and yet believe that we're okay because we got Jesus and we say Jesus is God. Well, big deal. It's as though we are the very people Yeshua warned us about when he said that there will be many declaring Lord, Lord, and yet not get into the kingdom. And when we believe this and say that stuff, that's what we're acting like. It's it's crazy. It is dangerous ground to be on. It is dangerously thin ice to be walking out on that stuff. I'm not saying that if you reject the Torah, you're lost and going to hell. What I am saying is you're in dangerous territory. You are playing Russian roulette with your soul. God knows the heart. And he will judge the heart, not the actions. He will judge the actions through the intention of the heart. Wow. But if you know this and you still reject it, you've been told this and you still reject it, you're on your own. Once again, most followers of Yeshua believe that we should obey his commands and do what he says. I think most people watching this would agree with that, that we should obey the commands of Yeshua. Let's forget about the other stuff. I'm going to obey the commands of what Yeshua said. Really? Because he said something else, and it's a command. It's not an it's not a, an opinion. It's it's not just some teaching like what we were looking at. Those weren't commands. He is explaining that the Torah is hanging on loving God and loving people as ourselves. But now he's going to actually give us a command. People get real nervous with this one. It's found in Matthew, again, Matthew 23, verses 1 through 3. And man, let me tell you, this one's hard. I'm not making this stuff up. Yeshua said it. That's, I'm just telling you what he said. Matthew Chapter 23, verse 1. Then Yeshua spoke to the crowds and his disciples. Hold on to that. He's speaking to everybody, including his disciples, saying, The Torah scholars, scribes, and Pharisees, they sit on the seat of Moses. So, there it is again, this conjunction, this connective statement based on that. Whatever they tell you, do and observe. But don't do what they do, for they say, and then they don't do it. The rest of that chapter, he is ripping the scribes and Pharisees apart. But verses 1, 2, and 3 says, you know, those guys, these religious leaders, they, they're sitting on the seat of authority, the seat of Moses. Therefore, do what they tell you. But don't do what they do because they say things and then they don't do it. So the first thing I want you to notice is that Yeshua is speaking to the crowds, not just Jews. So specifically it says he's speaking to the crowds, everybody that's there, whether they're Jew or not, they're just people. Are most of them Jews? Probably. Or Israelis? Probably. But you can't say that definitively. It's just the crowds of people. 
They could be anybody. It could be Romans. They're under Roman rule. People from all over the world are there. It's not just Jews. So he's speaking to the crowds and his disciples. <clears throat> So those are the two people groups he's talking to. So if we're going to be intellectually honest, at least with ourselves, we have to admit that this it's just not it's not just the Jews, but everyone else, which means it could and does by default include those of us that are not Jewish. So <clears throat> Yeshua states that the Torah scholars they sit on the seat of authority when they teach which is specifically referred to as the seat of Moses. And what this means is that they're teaching on the Torah when they do that. The writings of Moses given to him by God. Then he makes this very straightforward but strange, I get it, I give it to you, it's strange, command. So, therefore, do and observe whatever they tell you. Whatever they tell you, do it. Now, folks, uh, wow. Yeshua spends his whole ministry explaining that these men teach their traditions as the very commands of God and worship God in vain because of that. And now here, his command is that we are to follow what they teach. Doesn't that sound strange? And the rest of the chapter, he's just ripping them apart. Man, I mean, he's just, he's tearing them to pieces. <clears throat> and then he also cautions his, everybody that he just gave this command to, to not follow their actions. Now that makes it sound like it's even more confusing. And that is until you start to get into the details. So you have to go back and look at this, that he's stating that they're... <clears throat> Their seat of authority is that of Moses. So once again, this doesn't seem to lead us to believe that Moses has been done away with. This is a command. But it does help us to understand that the Torah is the final authority. He said, they're sitting on the seat of Moses. They're teaching on Moses. You need to do it. Whatever they say about Moses, and the, you need to do the Torah. <clears throat> This also helps us understand that the command is to follow Moses, but not the practice of the religious leaders' teachings. We're not to follow necessarily their teachings and their teachings that are outside of what the Torah teaches, but we are to follow what Moses says. That gets into something else I'm not going to chase today. Now, this also makes it clear that this command, this is his command to his followers, and it's not just a teaching topic. This is a command. And here's something that you need to pay attention to. This command, if you look into the actual words, it's in the imperative mode. It's not optional. So let me take this time to remind us that Yeshua also said that if we loved him, we would keep his commandments. That's what he said. And here's a command. People go, well, yeah, I love Jesus. I need to keep his commandments. Most Christians go, well, yeah, I, I love Jesus. We should follow what he says. Really? Do you really believe that? Here's what he said. And it's a command. And it's in the imperative. And he wasn't just talking to the disciples. So there's no way out of this. He's talking to everybody. You need to follow the Torah. Now, don't follow their teachings outside of that. And he spends the rest of this chapter. I mean, it's, it's incredible. The rest of this chapter, Yeshua calls these men out and he calls them slay, uh, snakes, washwat tunes, hypocrites, blind guides, and more. These are the very examples of why Yeshua told us not to do what they were doing, but we are to follow the authority of Moses. Now, is that so hard for us to believe? God, Yahovah himself, 
gave those very words to Moses as his instructions to his people and that they were to worship him and serve him and love each other. It's the goal. It's the target. Everything's hanging on these two. Of course, those words are authoritative. Why would they not be? To say that Yeshua nailed it to the cross, therefore we don't have to do it, is nonsensical and a direct contradiction to everything Yeshua said. Prove it to me from Scripture, from what Yeshua said. Now, you want to compare distorted words of Paul and all this other stuff. We'll get into those. This is what Yeshua said. And this is what he commanded us to do. And he said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We thought, oh, I love him. Well, this was his command. Yeah, but I'm not doing that. Okay, good luck. That's all I can say. Uh, good luck with that. Uh, folks, you need to think about this for a second. Modern Christian leaders are telling all of their followers not to not follow the teachings of God. Now, you tell them that, the hair's going to come up on the back of their neck and they're going to get offended and they're going to get mad. That is not what I'm saying. I'm like, well, that's exactly what you're saying. God in the flesh said, all of the Torah and the prophets hang on this, and God in the flesh commanded us to follow what it said, and you're telling us God nailed it to the cross, we don't have to follow it. Okay, God said follow it, Yeshua. You're saying don't follow it. Therefore, if that's the case, you're telling me to not follow what God said. You take that up with him. Don't take it up with me. Take it up with him. That's what he said, and it's a command. Look at it. Look at it in the imperative. Look at it in your Bible. Look it up. Get a blue letter Bible on your on the internet and just pull it up and look at it. It'll That'll tell you. It's in the imperative mode. It's a command. It's for everybody. And the thing is, they're dogmatic about this. They work so very hard to prove that their view on this is correct and will use and twist whatever passage they can to do it. What I'm asking from you simply is to read your Bible in context. Uh, that's it. Compare whatever you're reading to the very words of Yeshua. If it contradicts what Yeshua said, you have to answer this simple question, who's correct? If we're not supposed to follow the Torah, then why did Jesus tell us to follow and do and observe everything that they teach on the seat of authority, the seat of Moses, about the Torah? Why did Yeshua say the goal, loving God, loving men, is hanging, the whole law, the whole Torah and prophets are hanging on these two. You take this out, you got nothing. It's pointing to this. It's hanging on this. It's the summation of the Torah and the prophets, your Old Testament. Folks, Matthew 23 is not a contradiction to the teachings of Yeshua, but rather the complete affirmation of those teachings. To elevate the whole Word of God, including the Old Testament, the Torah, over that of religious practice, no matter who is telling you what is acceptable to God. Stop listening to people and read your Bible. That's hard to do. I get it. Been there, done that. Got the t-shirt, use it to wash my truck. I mean, I've been there. I understand it. If this is hard to swallow, I understand. I've been there. I'm just begging you to have the courage to be intellectually honest with yourself. Forget everybody else. Be intellectually honest with yourself. 
and look at it and go, that's what it says. And then grapple with it yourself, but search for truth as to what the scripture says and what Yeshua said, not what other people are telling you that he said. Now, all of this, once again, goes right back to the clear teachings in the Torah, which is this. Do not add to or take away from the words of this Torah, period. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. Live by it, period. And it doesn't matter who's telling you, you don't have to do that. If they are, they're lying. They are a false prophet, false teacher. Stop following them straight up. Now, folks, next week, we're going to cover more related passages about this Uh, But I hope these are starting to give us some clarification on the authoritative nature of the whole Word of God for our lives today. Most Christians would say, yeah, we should follow the whole Word of God, but I don't follow the Torah. They don't understand that the very words that are coming out of their mouths are contradictory. I should love Jesus and follow what Jesus said. And he's, this is what he said. Yeah, but I'm not going to do that because I don't have to follow the Torah. They don't understand that the very words that they're saying in their very practice, their very practice of faith and worship is contradictory to the very words of Yeshua. I, there's no way around it. And we, these people, all of us are in danger of being the people that say, Lord, Lord, I did great and mighty things in your name. What do you mean I'm not getting in? Two things. One, I never knew you. And based on that, what you were practicing was actually antinomianism, lawlessness, anti-Torah. And then you taught others to do that? The very best you can hope is to be called least in the kingdom of God. If that's your trajectory, the very best you're going to be able to hope for is to be called least in the kingdom. I, for one, am sick and tired of aiming at the basement. I'm not going to aim at the basement on purpose anymore. I'm aiming for the top. I want to please my God and my Savior. I want to do what he said. I want to honor him. I hope this is helping you. I hope this is making your faith more solid. I hope you're reading your Bible. Pray. I'm adding one. Repent. Read your Bible. Repeat. But you can start with the first three or or the three most fundamental. Pray, read your Bible, repeat. If you pray, read your Bible, and repeat, you're going to be repenting. Let me pray this prayer over us. Yavar Rekka Yalva Varish Mereka Yair Yalva Panavileka Vukaneka Isa Yalva Panavileka Vayasemlaka Shalom. May God Himself bless you and keep you. May God Himself be gracious to you, cause His face to smile upon you. May the one true God literally lift up His countenance upon you and give you His Shalom. And through that process, place his name upon you. If you need us, reach out to us, fourwinchchurch.org. Leave us a message on social media. Hopefully I'll get that. Hopefully I can get that in a timely fashion and respond to you. Do us a huge favor and mess with that algorithm. Artificial intelligence is really ramping things up. You can help us by sharing and leaving comments and give it a thumbs up and subscribe and all that stuff. It just helps with that algorithm stuff. And the only reason for that is is so that maybe somebody else will hear the truth, hear these messages, start reading their Bibles, and get closer to God and maybe even find salvation. It's not for me. It's, it's for the kingdom. Amen. If you need us, reach out to us. God bless you. And I truly, truly hope to see you soon. 